Good morning, all. As a reminder that God is alive, present, and wants us to hear from him, hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 14, 1 through 7. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abdominal thing, deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seeks after God. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt, and there is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers, to eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There are in great, they are in great terror, for God is in with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. This is the word of the Lord. As we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord.
My name is Paige Graziade, and I want to welcome you to Redeemer Baptist Church. We exist to glorify God by being a gospel-centered community of worshipers, proclaimers, disciples, servants, and stewards. We are glad you're worshiping with us this morning. If you are a guest or first-time visitor, we do have um, communication cards on the back table um, that we would love for you to fill out and stick in the tithe box. Also, if you have a prayer request that you would like us to be praying specifically for, you could put that in there as well. If you are a member or regular attender, we do have offering or tithe envelopes at the back table. And uh, if you choose to do that today, you can stick it in the box back there as well. Or you can give online through our website, redeemerbaptist.church. With that in mind, there are a few announcements for this morning. So our church's quarterly business meeting is happening today, immediately following service. So if we could do a quick teardown and then fellowship, um, there's a free lunch that will be provided. So please join us. This is a great time to hear about what is happening at RBC. Gospel in Life small groups will not be meeting tonight because we're having our quarterly business meeting. However, we will be meeting next week. Um, Also, our next Tech Sabbath Sunday is on May 22nd, so just keep that in mind. And then we are starting a new study today, so if you want to follow along and take notes, we have these Book of James um, scripture journals on the back table. I find them really helpful, so maybe you you do too. Again, we are so glad you are with us this morning. Uh, Now we'll have Theo lead us through a prayer of intercession. Thank you. In 1 Timothy 2, 1, it says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And so we're called in in 1 Timothy here to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, asking that Christ would intercede on their behalf. But why is that? What's the right interpretation of what's happening? Well, God gives us clarity, speaking through the prophet Isaiah in Ezekiel 22:30. I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. And so there's a wall in our defenses. We can think of our defenses as maybe some self-righteousness, some good works that we've done. There's, there's no limit to the amount of creative ways that we can believe that we don't have a hole in our wall, but the fact of the matter is it's there. And... Um, 
And so God wants us to stand in that gap like he, um, we see that Moses demonstrated in Exodus 32. And even better than that, we see Christ uh, on the cross doing it. They discuss it in Romans 8, 34, among other places, Hebrews uh, being another one. And that's not to say that any particular people or group specifically deserve what's happening to them, but rather it's to say that, that um, until Christ comes back, there is pain and there is suffering. Um, that's happening, and, and it's happening both tangibly and intangibly, and we're called by God to intercede. That is, we pray for intercession for both physical and spiritual suffering. So in light of our calling, we're about to do something that's a little bit difficult. We're, we're going to pray for both the people in Ukraine who are undergoing destruction and the people of Russia who are carrying out that destruction. We're going to be praying for God's work in our lives as well. So let's, uh, let's go to a time of prayer of intercession. Father, we, we begin today first off by, by praying for our brother uh, Farnham uh, and his family. We, we ask for supernatural healing from COVID, which is moving through his family. Lord, only you can provide both the spiritual, uh, physical, supernatural healing that's needed. Father, today um, our focus is on you. With all the things happening around us, it's too easy to shift our focus solely on the horizontal and miss the vertical implications of the events that we're reading in the news. Father, we confess today seven things. We confess that you are our strength, our refuge, our peace, our courage, our safety, our wisdom, and our light. Therefore, let us ask for more of you. Father, you are our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. We confess that we stand in fear as the borders of Ukraine give away. The earth is changing, but yet, Lord, you are our shelter. We see your presence manifesting in shelters across the world like the ones SPC are hosting. We pray that we be given the heart to locally support those resources financially and with all that we have that you've given to us. We pray that those shelters um, in the storm would lead to spiritual manifestations of supernatural changes of heart for the people of Ukraine. We ask and pray that refugees, disciples of the church in L Lviv, the Ukrainian Baptist Theological Seminary, and the Ukrainian believers would see that you're in control of death itself and an eternal shelter from it. And that would give them strength and peace and perseverance and courage. Lord, we ask that you would be with the refugee, refugees for safe passage out of the war zones. We ask that the refugees and the Russian protesters alike be strong and courageous and that you would go out with them. Give them a saving faith so that they wouldn't be afraid or terrified. For once you save your sheep, then you will go out with them. You will never leave or forsake them. Father, for those who are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom to us from God, we ask that we would know that wisdom. We ask that the government officials would know Jesus if they don't already. For without knowledge and relationship with Jesus, they cannot know wisdom. Shine the light of Christ into the darkness of their hearts in the hearts of both the government of Ukraine and Russia, as well as the men carrying out the wicked acts. Without the light of Christ shining into their lives, they cannot know what they do. And so we ask for forgiveness of sins, which comes only from righteousness, holiness, and redemption that comes from Christ. In your name I ask and pray these things. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Trust the sweetest rain 
but only trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing that again. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but only trust in Jesus' name. study God's word we're going to first go before God in prayer in order to confess our sins and admit our need for his grace we're going to ask him to convict forgive and cleanse us of our sins and we're going to ask that the Holy Spirit would illuminate our hearts and our minds as we hear the word proclaimed so I invite you to pray with me holy and merciful God in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in our wandering from your ways and wasting your gifts and in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O oh Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, as we have confessed our sins to you, allow us to believe that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten Son to live the life that we were meant to live but couldn't, and die the death that we have been condemned to die because of our sins and transgressions against you. Jesus, we know that anyone who is in you is a new creation. The old has passed away, and the new has come. We know that this was only made possible because for our sake, you who knew no sin became sin so that in you 
we might become the righteousness of God. Holy Spirit, now that we have had a chance to confess our sins and hear the assurance of our pardon because of what Christ has done for us, we ask that you would illuminate our hearts and our minds to see Jesus as this word is proclaimed. I pray for your faithful servant, Pastor Chris, that he would speak boldly, clearly, lovingly, and effectively as he shares this good news. And I pray that this proclamation would convict us and bring us to a place of repentance. God, we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, it's time for Children's Gospel. You may be seated, everyone. All right, it's time for the kids to come forward. If you're joining us online, now it's time to pause the video real quick and go get your kiddos. Come, come on, guys. Let's do this. All right, now. This is called the Children's Gospel Message, but it's for kids of all ages, right? So this has something for all of us to learn today. All right, when we come to church, when we hear God's word, what are we going to do? We're going to ask three questions each time, aren't we? All right, let's see. So three questions, that's correct. And what are they? What's the first question? Anybody? It's about God. What am I learning today about God? Okay, we always want to know that. There's always something we're learning about God. And then second question, Jesus. Always something we can learn about Jesus. And the third question, what am I going to learn about myself today? About me. All right? So we're going to listen for all three of these things in our lesson today. Now the first one, God, he made the, the earth. He made everything we see right? Um, and he had a plan for it. Where do we find his plan? In that book? The Bible. The Bible. Okay. Now, today we're going to talk about something um, that comes from the Bible that God tells us to do. See those words over there on the side? Get wise. What does that mean? Get wise. Become wise. Um, it's like getting smarter, wiser, learning things God wants us to learn right how do we learn he gave us a book what did we call it the Bible all right so God has a plan he always has a plan and so this time we're going to talk about getting wise all right now we are going to go to the next question which is about Jesus okay now we talked last week on Easter right about Jesus came and he died for us he died for us, okay? Now, once he died, he was not there for everyone to see anymore. <gasps> he was not there. And then all the Jews and the disciples, what did they do? They, they scattered. They scattered all around. They were gathered around him while he was teaching, and then they scattered all around. Now, what is this guy doing? What? He has a desk. What is next to him? Is, does that look like a letter, maybe, and a pencil? He is writing letters and sending them out, okay? He's writing letters and sending them out. And then what are we learning about ourselves? How can I get wisdom? I can read because you know what? I'm going to show you guys something. Look at this book that I have in my hands. What do you think this is? The Bible, okay? Now, look, the letter of James. <gasps> That's a letter. You know that guy? that we had in our slide just a minute ago? He was one of the disciples. What was he doing? After Jesus was gone, he was writing down. That's a God's plan. The disciples were writing down all the things that Jesus said so everyone could remember them. And they wrote them in letters, and they sent them out. And you know what? We have those letters. Did you know we have those letters? Yes, we do. Okay. So we just finished the, the last slide. Sorry, guys. That was way too quick. Okay. All right, you can go ahead and stop it. But let's just say that we're going to study this again when we go to our kids' lesson. And you guys are all going to study today how we can use the book of James to get wise. All right, thank you, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to apologize ahead of time for my voice. Um, I am down with a little bit of a cold, and it is a cold. Uh, we, we have been COVID tested, 
uh, just so everybody can relax a little bit. And you guys stay back there, and I'll be up here. We should be good to go, all right? Uh, you pray for me while I'm, I'm uh, sharing God's word with us this morning. For those of you I haven't had a chance yet to meet or who are watching us on video, my name is Chris, and I'm the lead pastor here at Redeemer and we are so excited that we get to break bread together. We get to open up God's word and hear God's voice to us. So I want to invite you to do that. Open up your copy of God's word to the book of James. As Paige mentioned earlier, if you are here present with us, uh, we can hand each and every one of you your own personal copy of the book of James. It's an excerpt and it's a scripture journal format. So along with all of the text, there's pages for you to take notes and you can take one of these home with you uh, so that you can have your own notes as you go through our study. We are beginning today a series that we have entitled Get Wise, Get Wise, because the book of James is a New Testament book of wisdom. It's a New Testament book of wisdom. It's very similar to the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. It's all about how God's people can live in the light of the good news of Jesus Christ in ways that are wise. Um, we want to help you not only learn this yourself, we want to help you be able to invite your friends and family to participate in getting wise. So on the table on the way out today, we want to encourage you, pick up some of these cards. They're little invitation cards, and they say, get wise, and they have all of the information about today's worship service. And we want to encourage you, bring your friends. Uh, who doesn't need more wisdom in this world, right? So we want to encourage you, pick one of these cards up, pick up 10 of them, 15 of them, 20 of them, hand them out to your friends, neighbors, coworkers. Uh, and invite them, say, hey, listen, let's go learn how to get wise together. Not how to be wise guys, but, you know, just wise, all right? So let's read together. We're just going to read the first 12 verses in the book of James, uh, the letter of James. And uh, we're going to read these together. And uh, I'm going to tell you in advance that we are not going to go in depth into these 12 verses today. We're going to fly at the 10,000 foot level sort of and do an overview of the book of James because we feel like it's so important for you to understand why James is writing and what the context is for the people he's writing to and how that applies to us. So we're going to kind of take a high level view of it today and then in the many weeks ahead we're going to break it down into a much closer inspection. So let's read together from James chapter 1 beginning at verse 1 and we will read through verse 12. James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass so its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Now, this is God's holy, inerrant, and eternal word. May he add his blessing to its reading and its proclamation. As we think about this book of James, 
we want to understand the context and the content of the book if we were to understand the individual pieces. So let me just encourage you as a pastor, when you go to read God's word on your own and you're reading it at home, it's great to have like a study Bible or some commentaries along with you because we can, uh, in some ways, misunderstand God's word if we take isolated verses out of context. And it's important for us to understand what the, the biblical writers had as their intent and what their goals were, who they were writing to, and why they were writing if we're to clearly understand God's word. So the book of James is written to God's people. All right, and we're going to take a look at specifically which group of people is written to. But these people are living in a broken reality. One of the great things about God's word is that God never glosses over the heartache, the brokenness, and the evil that we see in this world. And Christians are not called to be deniers of the reality that is broken around us. In fact, we have the best explanation there is in the world for why and how things are broken. So we're going to talk about that, how James is writing to people who are living in a broken reality. And then we're going to see that James is writing to a people who have been gifted by God with a profound hope. They're not living in this broken world hopeless or frustrated or trying to achieve man-made agendas, but they've been gifted a profound hope that comes to them through God's wisdom. And then we're also going to see today that, that in the midst of this, that those same people are called to do something with that wisdom that they've been gifted with. And that's to receive it in order for them to actually be able to live the lives that God has called them to. So we'll take a look at this in three main sections. Living in a broken reality, the profound hope that we have through God's wisdom, and how we are called to receive God's wisdom so that we can actually live and live well. So let's talk about the fact that James is, is a realist. Uh, if you read the book, you'll understand that he's very pragmatic he gets straight to the point. There's very little time spent encouraging people with, with soft phrases or wooing. There's very little time spent greeting individuals that you might see in other letters. Uh, there's not a lot of, of biography or background here. James says, hey, this world is broken. I want to help you deal with that broken reality. And he's going to acknowledge that. And he's going to be talking to a specific group of people, at people who are in exile. James is a pastoral letter. Uh, James is writing with a pastor's heart. He identifies himself there in verse 1 as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? That's who he says that he is. Well, who is this guy, James? Now, let me clarify something. This is not James, the brother of John, who was a fisherman, who followed Jesus. It was not the guy who was one of the original 12. That James was executed shortly after uh, the church began to really, really grow and thrive. He was the first of the apostles to be martyred. We know that, and uh, the, the book of James was almost certainly written much later than when that James was executed. So who is this James that's writing this? Well, this is James the just, or James the humble, sometimes called James the elder, but not to be confused with the fact that sometimes we call the other guy James uh, the older brother of, of John, or, the, or there possibly were twins, who knows? We, we call him sometimes the elder, but so it wasn't him. And there was another disciple that sometimes went by the name James, not that guy either. So who is this guy? This is the half-brother of Jesus. Now, Jesus had physical brothers and sisters, though Mary did not have sexual relations with uh, Joseph prior to the birth of Jesus, scripture is abundantly clear that Mary had many children. She had many uh, uh, brothers, uh, physical brothers, half-brothers to Jesus, and, uh, and also sisters. So this is Jesus' half-brother. Uh, he did not believe in Jesus throughout his entire life. In fact, according to scripture, he had to have a special encounter with the risen 
Jesus. He is one of the named people that Jesus appeared to after his crucifixion and his resurrection. And so he encountered that risen Jesus and became the leader of the Jerusalem church. Um, we know this from multiple places in scripture. By the time that before, before Pentecost, James is already taking an active role in leading the church in prayer. By the time of Acts chapter 15, James is the lead pastor of the Jerusalem church, not one of the 12 guys who followed Jesus around. Uh, he becomes the guy who is focused on the pastoral ministry of the church there in Jerusalem and aimed much of his ministry to the Jewish people. And that would go on for apparently many decades from what we can tell from scripture and from church history. So this James is writing a letter to a scattered and exiled people. If you go back to verse one, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. He's writing primarily to Jewish background believers who have been forced out of the, their native country. They've been dispersed abroad. They are people who are in exile. And why is that helpful for you and me to know? Because we as Christians live as a people who are in exile. We are not yet in our native home either. We are not of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. And James is writing to people who have been scattered and exiled across the Roman world. And like those people, we often encounter difficulties, right? So James says in verse 2 that he is writing to people who are encountering various trials, trials of various kinds that are happening to them, right? So he's writing to people who are facing the reality of being in a broken world. Now, we know what some of those trials were from different things that scripture teaches us. Some of the trials were because of persecution. You may remember that shortly after Jesus had been resurrected and spent 40 days with his disciples and then left them and they spent another 120 days or so uh, waiting on this moment when the Pentecost the Holy Spirit would come upon them, you may remember that after that there was this explosive growth in the church. And the result of the church's growth was not that the world around them was so excited about the church growing and so many people being one to Jesus. Rather, persecution broke out. And the Jerusalem church was scattered. If you look in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, we can see that those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, they traveled as far as Phoenicia and, and, uh, and Cyprus and Antioch, and they were speaking the word to no one except Jews. They would go on from there to begin to speak to Hellenistic Jews, people who had a, a Greek background, and then to Gentiles of all kinds. What you and I need to re take away from this is the recognition that James is writing to people who have been likely forced from their homes, forced from their lands because of violence and persecution. In the last few months, uh, somewhere between uh, five million and six million Ukrainians in just the last 50 days have been forced out of their homes, right? A mass movement of people is happening. They're being forced into exile, either within Ukraine or out of, outside of the borders. Well, James is writing to people that have been scattered, believers that have been forced out into the wide world because of violence, because of uh, hatred of their faith. Now, that's not the only trials that James is going to know that people are going to encounter. Some of the trials were the result of other people's choices or circumstances, things that happened to them, right? We often think of our trials this way. Something happens to me, it's not my fault. Somebody may be oppressing me economically, racially, or ethnically, uh, maybe religiously. We may be thinking about uh, financial difficulties, which may or may not be of our own making, but but they're real difficulties. 
Uh, and certainly the difficulties of being a refugee or being of an ethnic or religious minority. To be a Jew was already to be an outcast in the Roman world. To be a Jewish Christian meant that you weren't, weren't accepted by any group of people. The Gentiles hated you and the Jews hated you. So those were things that they didn't have uh, any responsibility, perhaps, for themselves. And you're going to see as we go through the book, James is going to address all of these types of issues. But you're also going to see that he's going to address trials that result from our own choices, right? There's things that happen to us, or bad people or evil may happen to us, but there's also trials that happen because of bad choices that we make, right? And we so rarely want to own those things. And James is going to do that. He's going to point out how some of their trials are a result of relational conflict. Some of their trials are because the people in the church, despite the fact that they're scattered and they're this small group whenever they do gather together, some of them are trying to take advantage of each other. They're trying to manipulate power and wealth in ways that should not be happening within the church. They're going to have huge inconsistencies in their spiritual life. They're not living out the reality of the good news of Jesus. So these kinds of trials are all going to be taken on by James. What James wants them to grasp is that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is to be lived out in ordinary life within this broken world. Uh, so often, we grapple with this reality as Christians. You know, we say, I'm, I'm a believer, I'm following Jesus, I read my Bible, I go to church, I do all these things. And then the first trial or difficulty that comes upon us, our faith begins to dissipate immediately, and we become focused and locked in on the brokenness or the issue. It may be a relational challenge, it may be a financial situation, it may be some greater evil that's happening to us, and all we can think about is that thing. And James wants us to understand that's not how we're called to live. We are called to live out the reality of the gospel in ordinary lives within a broken world. And this should not surprise us as Christians. Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Not might, you will have that. And in fact, the apostles were all eager for, uh, to re uh, cause us to recognize that this is ordinary for believers. Just because you got saved does not mean all your problems ended. And we have a temptation that's deep in our souls to believe that the Christian faith is built for those moments of goodness, but not for all the brokenness in this world. Peter would write to a persecuted group of people, a little bit later on, almost certainly in church history, and he would say, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial that comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Why do we think it's odd for us as believers to experience painful and difficult things in a broken world? That's would in fact, be odd for us to not experience brokenness and painful things because this world is fallen. Further, the apostles are eager for us to recognize that trials and temptations and tribulations in this world are in fact necessary, necessary for our faith. And you're going to see that argument come up over and over again in James. It wasn't just James's idea. The apostles would go through the churches, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and they taught the early church that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. It's necessary for believers to suffer because as James is going to unpack, and we're going to see this more clearly in two weeks' time, as we study uh, more in depth in chapter 1, James is going to point out that God is using the brokenness of this world to refine our faith and to shape us into who he wants us to be. Now, that does not mean that Jesus wants us to live defeated or frustrated or broken lives ourselves. The world may be broken, 
Bad things may happen to us. We have to own and recognize the brokenness that we bring ourselves into. But Jesus does not intend for us to live defeated or frustrated lives in this broken world. James is going to say to the church here, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. In other words, when you encounter the brokenness of this world, there is supposed to be something different about how Christians react to a flat tire, a failed marriage, a bad diagnosis from the doctor, and all of the other brokenness that's in this world. We are to count it all joy. How is that possible? How is it possible for Christians to be so different from the rest of the world. We, the world, and so often me, and I suspect many of you, when we encounter some brokenness in this world, an illness, an uncomfortable situation comes upon us, or some greater life difficulty, what do we do? We complain. We grumble against God. Maybe we shake our fist at Him. Maybe we try and deny or walk away from our faith. Maybe we try and scramble our way out of it and fix the situation ourselves, or we try to deny the reality of the brokenness that's around us. This happens to many people who get medical diagnoses they don't like, and they immediately go into this phase of denial, where they want to say that's not true, no matter how obvious it is. James says there's supposed to be something different about how Christians react and respond to this broken world. Now, here's what you and I need to grasp. God intends for you and me to have real peace and real rest in this broken world because of his overcoming power. Because of his overcoming power. Jesus said this in John 16, I have said to you these things to you that in me you may have peace, shalom, wholeness, integrity of life. In other words, all of Jesus' teaching is designed to bring us to a place of wholeness in life. Then he says, in this world you will have tribulation. Not that you'll get out of tribulation, but you will. And then he says, take heart. This is supposed to change your heart. I have overcome the world. In other words, Jesus says, no matter what situation you are in, whether it's a bad health diagnosis, an empty bank account, a firing unjustly from a job, or any relational difficulty, Jesus says, don't you understand that situation, that illness, that brokenness, that trial is not in charge. It does not have ultimate authority over your life. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. And the way you live in this world in joy and peace is for you to rest in the fact that Jesus is ultimately in control of all of these things. And he intends for us to live in victory through our ordinary trials and tribulations. Now, listen to me please very carefully. I did not say Jesus intends for us to live in victory over ordinary trials and tribulations. There's a form of Christianity that buys into a prosperity good news, which says that in every trial and temptation, you are going to be the winner on the opposite side. Here's the problem with that. Christians die all the time. In fact, there's a 100% death rate for Christians. They all die. Some disease is going to get you. You may be victorious temporarily over cancer, but you will die of something. Right? And guess what? It doesn't seem to matter how much money you stockpiled. In the end, you will not have enough resources to save your own life. Here's what I'm trying to point out to you and me. Christian, you are decide, designed by God to live in victory through 
all of your trials and tribulations, not over them. In other words, you may never get that relationship that you want. You may never get that ideal job that you think you deserve. You may never operate in the health that you wish you had. You may never get free of all of the pain that is in this world. In fact, it's extremely unlikely that you will. The Christian life is about victory through those trials and tribulations, through all of that. Now, that does not mean that God does not provide temporary resources or temporary health or temporary healing or temporary blessing or that there aren't many good things that your God gives you. James is going to argue that all good gifts come from him. But he is trying to make a point to us that there is to be a joy in the trials and the tribulations. So that we can say, as we've been taught by the Apostle Paul, in all of the trials and tribulations and persecutions of this world, in all these things, we are conquerors because of the victory of Jesus Christ. We are conquerors because God has loved us. Cancer will never have the final victory over my life. It may kill me, Jesus will raise me. My bank account may go empty, but I am building treasure in heaven that cannot be taken away. I may have rusty cars here, but there's no rust in eternity. I may not have the family, the relationship that I want to have here, but in all eternity, I will be satisfied with the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit amidst the great and mighty family of God. Do you understand that none of those trials have ultimate authority over your life? Okay, James is going to argue that in the midst of this broken reality, God wants us to be a people of joy, a people of victory, because he's gifted us with so many good things. He's gifted us with a profound hope. And specifically, James is going to be making the point that we have this profound hope because we can live a victorious life in the here and now through divine wisdom, through God-given wisdom. So uh, I, I love the fact that uh, you can go to the book of James and see so many major themes. Uh, some of you ladies were part of the TGCW uh, study of the book of James, and the, they brought out the focus of steadfastness, right? We're going to talk a lot about that. Other biblical scholars, David Platt would point out, for example, in his commentary, that James has much to do with the interaction between faith and works, and we will talk about that. But I love how uh, scholars like Sam Albury and, and Scott McKnight have pointed out that James is this New Testament book of wisdom. It's about living the practical realities of the gospel in the ordinary places of life. So in James 1.5, as Jason's going to teach us next week in a wonderful message that he's been preparing, uh, we're going to read things like this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. James says there is a way to live in this broken world, and it's through the wisdom that God gives us. Well, what is wisdom? Wisdom is not mere knowledge. It is, in fact, the how of a joy-filled, victorious life. Okay? Wisdom is not just knowing what to do or when to do it. It's about how. How do I live out the reality of the good news of Jesus in the midst of this trialed life? You may also think of it this way. It's not merely knowledge, but it is applied spiritual knowledge, decision-making, and behavior under the direction, and I would even argue, the power of God. It's applied spiritual knowledge. Now, you and I know this, that God wants us to pursue wisdom. God does not want Christians to be intentionally foolish and certainly in the worldly sense. Over and over again, scripture says things like this. The beginning of wisdom is this. 
Get Wisdom. That's the title of our series, Get Wise. Many people spend their lives frittering their lives away on so many things that seem important to them. We could do this on Twitter. We can do it in, uh, in junk novels. We can do this by hobbies galore. We can do it in busyness of jobs. We can do it by, by going from one soccer game to the next volleyball game to, of our kids. We can spend our lives frittering them away on a million things that, that don't last and yet never pursue being wise. The scripture says God wants you to live a life of wisdom. He wants you to know how to live in a way that glorifies him in this world, that brings you to peace and to joy. And only fools despise God's wisdom. Scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And there is much made of foolishness in this world. People say, I know how to live, and yet we see the outcomes of their lives. Brokenness all around. Godly wisdom leads us to a place of wholeness and maturity, completeness. James is going to say in James chapter 1, verse 4, we read it earlier, let steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect. The word is telos there, mature, complete, so that you can come to the end of the life that God intended you to have. What should have happened were the fall not true, as Adam and Eve were intended to live, to come to wholeness and completeness. He says, and complete or whole, lacking in nothing. Godly wisdom leads us to a place of maturity. A lack of wisdom will always lead us to an unstable and shifting life. Do you ever feel like the trials and difficulties of this world just seem to knock you around? You're never really aware of how you ought to be handling it. You lose your temper, you get frustrated, you break down with your emotions, you get filled with anxiety. You feel like every difficulty in this world sort of like smacks you around. You ever gone out to the ocean and really had the ocean have its way with you? Some of you probably have known me long enough, you can see this really a great map of Africa that I have on my forehead right here, this scar right here. Uh, that's because... Uh, now, 17 years ago or so, uh, I went out on a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful island off the coast of Indonesia and was body surfing among some beautiful waves and a giant monster wave came along and picked me up and plowed me headfirst into a coral reef. Uh, here's the thing. I'm a very good swimmer. I used to actually instruct lifeguards and I can tell you, it didn't matter how good of a swimmer I was, that wave was going to do whatever it wanted to me. Have you ever felt like that in life? Something happens to you? Guess what? For believers, you're not supposed to live that way. You're not supposed to be carried along by all the brokenness and trials of this world. You're not supposed to be unstable. And shifting. In fact, James is going to make this point. And again, Jason's going to help us unpack this. But he says that, that people that don't have the wisdom of God, they're like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Or he describes us also variously as double-minded people. People of two minds constantly in one corner or in the other. This or that. Never making a single choice. Unstable in all our ways. Here's how we know we are not intended to be that way. We are created in the image of God, recreated in the image of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, born again, and we're being grown up into the maturity that is supposed to be ours. And God is not unstable. God is not tossed and turned by all of the brokenness of this world. In fact, James is going to say 
that God is the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He's painting different pictures. We are constantly being tossed about like waves in the ocean. We're double-minded. We can't get in. We can't get out. We can't make the right choices in the midst of these things. But God... God isn't like the shadows that change all around you and are constantly moving. God is infinitely stable. Therefore, if you and I are unstable in all of life, it is not because of God, James is going to say. It is, in fact, because of our own wicked desires. You can look at that in James 1, 13 through 15. And it is because of worldly wisdom. We've adopted the world's how when we face all the brokenness of the world. So in James 3, 15 and 16, James is going to say there's this wisdom that does not come from God, and it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. By the way, that is not just true of the ideology that does not fit your political preference. This week hanging out with 11,000 or so pastor friends. It was amusing to me to hear really well-educated scholars identify certain worldly philosophies as being earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. The irony is that those same men have identified other, uh, are, are partakers in other worldly philosophies, which they would minimize as having demonic influence. You know, some people say, I'm a conservative, and that's good. Brothers and sisters, conservatism is an earthly philosophy. And it is pursued wholeheartedly as a worldview, unspiritual and demonic. Every bit as much as progressivism and liberalism. All ideologies that lift themselves up against the living God will lead you to instability. All of them. This is not a wisdom that comes down from above. In fact, wherever there is worldly philosophy that takes over, there will be disorder and every vile practice. That's why if you pursue political right-wingism, you end up with Nazi fascism, which murders six, seven million Jews and millions more. And if you pursue left-wing ideologies, To their ultimate end, you end up with Marxist communism and you kill 11 million people in the Ukraine in the 1950s. There's every disorder and vile practice where worldly philosophies take over. So James is going to list throughout this passage, and we don't have time to look at all this. This is just like highlights, right? 10,000 feet level. But James is going to point out some of the symptoms of an unstable and foolish life. He's going to say that there's pursuit and hoarding of wealth. And that's going to lead you to instability. You're going to end up pursuing influence and glory from men. You're going to have uncontrolled and unkind speech. You're going to have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. You're going to be full of judgmentalism and self-righteousness. All of these things come from following the world's ways of living. He's going to go on to say that, that this worldly philosophy of living will lead you to a place of the illusion of controlling your own destiny. You'll begin to practice injustice and economic oppression of others. You'll end up fighting and committing murder and violence. You'll become a friend of the world, but you'll end up being God's enemy. All of this is the overflow of an unstable life. But then James is going to say, the wisdom that you get from God is so different. It's radically different. The wisdom you get from God is pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's open to reason. It's full of mercy and good fruits. It's impartial and sincere. There is a way of living that looks like Jesus. And it's not the way the world looks. In fact, if you follow this wisdom, James is going to point out it's going to change you from being that unstable person 
to being somebody who's steadfast in all of life's trials. It's going to make you into a grateful person. It's going to make you into a person who's careful with your speech and with your temper. It's going to make you into a person who's consistently obedient to God and a minister to the weak and the hurting. It's going to make you impartial in your behavior and love. In other words, it looks so radically different than that. James is going to go on to say you follow God's wisdom and it will make you humble and merciful to others. It will bring you to a place of persistent repentance before God. You'll become submissive and joyful to God's providence. You'll be prayerful and hopeful in the midst of your prayers. You'll become gospel partners with God's people. Now, do you see the contrast that James is trying to point out? We're going to go through all of that in depth over the next few months, but I want you to to get this high-level view that there's this broken way of trying to live in this world, and there's this redeemed way of trying to live in this world, and they don't come from the same fountain of truth. They're radically different. Wisdom, James will say, will always reveal itself through a transformed life. How do you know if somebody is wise? Well, they're going to look different. James says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness or humility of wisdom. In other words, if you've really got life on the hook, what will your life look like? It will look like all those great qualities that we just talked about, right? So, there's a broken reality, but we live in a profound hope because God has gifted us with his wisdom. But you could say, but so many Christians don't seem to live like that. I don't live like that. Not nearly as consistently as I should. Why is that? And James is going to say, Because you have to do something with the wisdom that God is giving. You have to receive it. You have to receive it. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. Brothers and sisters, if I say to you, here's a gift, it may be a, a... a chocolate bar, or it may be a Maserati, or a $10 million uh, balance in your bank account. In any case, what do you have to do if I'm trying to give you a gift? Take it. (laughs) Take it, right? God is a generous giver, and if you and I are not living in ways that are wise in light of the gospel, is it not most likely not that God has been lacking in his generosity, but that we are really bad at receiving that which God has given us? Isn't that more likely? Yes. Yes, it is. (laughs) I'm so glad you guys asked that question, right? God alone can give us a life-transforming and inward wisdom. I love how the Christian Standard Bible puts this translation in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Which means if you need to understand how to live in this world, you got to go to God. Now, can I just, I want to stop here. God is abundant in his grace and his goodness, right? He causes rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. God gives brilliant scientists knowledge and understanding of the ways this universe works. God creates systems of mathematics, and you can understand those things whether or not you are a Christian or not. This kind of common grace knowledge is gifted to the world. But there is a knowledge and wisdom that comes on living how to live in this world that is gifted to believers. And it comes from the mouth of the Lord to his children so that we can hear and understand him. Because God is at work inside the lives of believers doing something radically different. Look at Psalm chapter 51, 
um, verse 6 in your own copy of God's Word. If you don't have that verse highlighted, you should highlight that in your Bibles, electronic or otherwise. Highlight it. Because God does not want you to have a mere outward wisdom. He wants you to have integrity or wholeness in your inmost being, is the way another translation puts that. If you peel away all the layers of your life and you get down to that most core part of you, is that a place of peace and wholeness? Or is that a place of anxiety, fear, frustration, brokenness, hiding from bad things that have happened to you? God has a wisdom that penetrates to the deepest layer of your reality. And God wants to teach you wisdom deep within your soul. So we must ask for it, brothers and sisters, and we must receive it. Jesus said, everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be open. Ask God, right? James is going to parallel this, by the way, in James chapter 4. He's going to say, you don't have, why? Because you don't ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. God, help me to know the winning lotto numbers, is not a prayer that will be answered. Okay? That would be wrongly. But we don't receive so often, brothers and sisters, just because we don't ask, God, how do I live in this moment? God, how do you want me to respond to this medical diagnosis? God, how do you want me to respond to this broken relationship, this challenge at my job? How do I raise children that are pleasing to you? God, how do I navigate declining health, the loss of independence? Ask. Can I just point out that not all of us actually want to receive God's wisdom? We don't, because it goes against our wisdom. See, the truth is, I think I know how to live. I think I know what's best in the moment. And Satan certainly knows how to exacerbate that. He came to Eve with this same kind of mentality. He says, Eve, he says, I know God told you not to look at that tree, but look at that tree over there. Don't you think it looks good? Eve, I know God, the creator who made you from dust, told you that you would die if you partook of that tree, but surely not. In fact, guess what? God's not good. He's holding out on you. You can be like him. And that same set of lies infiltrates every one of our human hearts, every one of our mentality, so that we don't actually believe in the moment that God really does know how best to use our bodies, our minds, our lives, and our very beings in any given situation at all times for his glory and our good forever. We don't believe that. And that unbelief causes us to not receive that which God wants to give us. James is going to say this in James 1.21. Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Put these things away. Why? So you can receive with meekness, with humility, the implanted word of God. You want to live a wise life? Get the garbage out of your life. Make room in your mind and in your life to receive God's word with humility. Some of us would like to hear God's word, God's wisdom, but we don't actually want to live in it. We like a, a, this sort of weird thing. I, I like going to church. I like reading the Bible. I like... Uh, it, it's like a fascinating philosophy, a good ideology. I have seen many, many professional Christians living out 
the reality of knowing God's word in depth far better than me and far better than you. And yet when you look at the character of their lives and you look at how they live out the reality of their day-to-day focus and their interactions with human beings, it does not smell like Jesus at all. It doesn't look like Jesus at all. In fact, it's the antithesis because they want to hear about the wisdom of God. They don't want to live in the wisdom of God. They want to use earthly wisdom. There's an entire movement in contemporary American Christianity that is pharisaical and self-righteous and it is condemning of so many brothers and sisters in Christ and it is full of anger and bitterness and demeaning of godly people. And it happens whenever we think, yes, yes, I know the wisdom of God, but I'm not responsible to live in the wisdom of God. In fact, I'm going to adopt worldly philosophies and strategies for getting what I really want. James would say, be doers of the word. Long before Nike, James said, just do it. (laughs) Just do it. Don't be hearers only. Lying to yourself, deceiving yourself. If you're a hearer of the word and not a doer, you're like somebody who looks in your natural face in a mirror. You look at yourself, you walk away, and you once forget what you look like. But if you look into the perfect law of God, the law of liberty, where true freedom is found, and you persevere in it, you stay there, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, you will be blessed in your doing. You will know how to live in your present broken reality with joy and peace and hope. So, we've talked about people who don't want to receive God's wisdom. We've talked about people who wish to hear God's wisdom but not live in it. Some of us are in this last category. We wish to hear God's wisdom, but we don't want to live through it. Not just in it, but through it. Now, here's here's something you and I need to grasp. God's wisdom isn't just intended to help us live in the here and now. Rather, we are being reshaped. We are being renewed for a new and perfect reality. God's wisdom isn't just the how to live in the here and now. God's wisdom is for how to live at all and forever. It's what gives life itself. In the book of Proverbs, we find that wisdom is personified and wisdom says, I was there when all of life was created. Wisdom is what brings life into reality. James is going to say this, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. The wisdom that God has for you is not merely good advice. It's good news of a way to actually come from death to life. To enter into the reality of the resurrection in the here and the now. Let me try and unpack this briefly as we close. Wisdom has a name. His name is Jesus. Wisdom has a name, and his name is Jesus. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. The Apostle Paul makes this expressly clear. To everyone who's been called by God, Jews or Greeks, Christ is the power of God, and Christ is the wisdom of God. Wisdom has a name, and his name is is Jesus, and it's through him that we gain lasting wisdom. Ephesians 1, 17, 
Paul says that he wants to praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, and he wants him to give the church the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. You want to get the spirit, the Holy Spirit of God in your life, filling you with wisdom, it's going to be revealing to you that wisdom through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is a perfect place that demonstrates the reality of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are working together to make you no longer a fool, but to make you into the image of of Jesus Christ. We gain a lasting wisdom. Through Jesus, we grow up mature, stable, and steadfast. We're no longer tossed by waves that are all around us. In Colossians 1, 28, we find there that, that him, Jesus, we proclaim, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Why? So that through him, we can present everyone mature in Christ. I was talking to a pastor this last week about his discipleship and some people in his church. And he said, you know, they, they seem to be struggling with, with knowing how to handle a particular situation. And I said, it's because in this particular case, your leader thinks that a Bible study is about transfer of knowledge. Folks, you never, ever, ever study God's word in the abstract. It's never just a good idea. It's always intended to change you. It's living and active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, piercing to the deepest part of your being. So when you go to a Bible study, you should say, I should expect to leave here changed. And when you're studying God's word with God's people, you should expect divine Wisdom that helps you grow up. Jesus is the wisdom that we teach and sing about. Let me show you how scripture makes this so clear. Colossians 3.16. Paul says, let the word of Christ, God's word, the words about Jesus, dwell in you. Should be alive and present in you. Richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. We sing about Jesus, we teach about Jesus because he's the wisdom from God. He's our how to live now and forever. He is the only wisdom that can and will save us from our sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 and 31. Because of God, the Father, Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us, now watch this progression, wisdom from God. Who's your wisdom? His name is Jesus. He's right there. That's the way to live. He is my only source of living, and He's the way to live, right? He's our wisdom. But more than that, He became our righteousness, so that we have right standing with God. We were guilty of our sins. Jesus has paid the price for our sins. He's justified us in the eyes of that God. And he's covered us with the robe of his own righteousness. But more than that, he's not just our wisdom and our righteousness. He's also our sanctification. He's the way that we become more and more holy. That's all that word means. To become more and more like God. He's the way we become different from the rest of the world. It's through Jesus. He's also our redemption. Did you see that? He's our wisdom. He's our righteousness. He's our sanctification. And he is our redemption. He's the undoing of all the past foolishness has brought into your life and my life. He takes that inside us which is broken and he brings it together and turns it into something beautiful in his time, all for the glory of God. Now, can any worldly wisdom or philosophy promise you that? Why would we boast or make our confidence in any 
ideology. When we could say, Jesus Christ, he's my wisdom. He's my righteousness. He's my sanctification. He's everything. He's my redemption. He takes all that was broken and makes it new. He saves me from sin and death and Satan. So how do you respond to wisdom made flesh? Well, Herod tried to kill him. His own village rejected him. His brothers and sisters mocked him. His disciples barely understood him. And on the night he was betrayed, they ran away from him because the wisdom of God looked so foolish to this world. Surely, this could not be God's plan for changing everything. And at the cross, the wisdom of God was put on a tree and became the curse of God so that the people of God could be bought by the blood that is shed, washed clean, and set free so that the risen king who came out of the tomb, wisdom defeating death and Satan and life, broken by this world, but now healed. That wisdom could be indwelling in the people of God. Now and forever. So how do you deal with that? Can I just say that the, maybe the biggest takeaway you and I need to take away from this today, this overview, is to humble ourselves and say, God, I have been and then in, in my inmost being, so often so foolish. I bought into so many worldly philosophies and ideologies. And now, I want them out. I want you in. Maybe there's areas of your life that you have not yet surrendered. Maybe, maybe that's what you need to commit to today. Say, God, I'm opening the closet in this part of my life, and I'm, I'm letting you, wisdom, come in here, your light, your truth. Maybe you've never really understood till today that Jesus was given to you as a gift of God to save you from your sins. Maybe you want to ask him to be your Savior and Lord, to reign in your life and heart today. Maybe you just need to say, God, I've been saying I followed you. But the truth is, I've been following the wisdom and ways of this world. And today I need to come home. Let's go ask God for that. Father, can we just confess so often we are so foolish, twisted, broken, full of ourselves and worldly ideologies, the ways and ideas of man. So often we're rejecting wisdom made present and personal to your son. So often we're guilty of taking Jesus and turning him into a good idea instead of being the good news that changes everything. So for the first or the most recent time today, we open our hearts, our minds, our wills, our emotions to you. And ask that you would come and indwell us as we humble ourselves before you. Not only today, but as we study through this book. And may the lives that we live look different. Because of your grace, your wisdom indwelling us. Oh, come, O oh Holy Spirit, and do this work in the name of Jesus we ask. Let's stand and worship. When I hear my Savior there, Christ 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have something different for each of us. May we get wise and be wise to find out what that is this week as we spend time with him in prayer, in his word, with our brothers and sisters, in silence and solitude, in the chaos and confusion that can enter our lives. Please join me in prayer. Thank you so much, dear Father, for giving us this opportunity of a bird's eye view or higher and of a deep dive exploration into James. Help us to live out what we learn May we be consistent day by day doers of your word and not Sunday hearers only. You tell us, but this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. May we get wise by looking into your word this week and throughout this series, not to become selfish collectors of unused knowledge, but rather to conform more and more closely to the image and character of Jesus, who loved us 
and gave his life for us. Draw us closer and closer and closer still to you this week. Help us to be wise, to bring our hopes, our dreams, our thanks, our praise, our thoughts, our hearts, our burdens, our needs, our families, our friends, our friends we haven't met yet, our everything to you. Help us to be on the lookout for your work in and through us, likely in ways we can't predict and don't expect, but in ways much better than we could ever have imagined. May we speak wise, to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, no matter what race, nationality, gender, social status, political persuasion, or sinful or upstanding background. You welcome anyone who calls upon Jesus for salvation. And may we live wise so that we bring glory to you, Jesus, and Holy Spirit in all that we do and say. So at the end of our short span of days here on earth, we can approach death confidently with no regrets, looking forward to shedding our earthly bodies like the butterfly releases its chrysalis, ready to one day hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you, Father, for choosing us and calling us to you to get wise, be wise, speak wise, and live wise. Grace us with the joy of living wholeheartedly for you and your kingdom this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, hear and receive God's encouragement in our sending verses, Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We now have our quarterly business meeting coming up. And we have lunch for hungry tummies. No gospel in life groups tonight because of our business meeting. But watch for that next week and be ready. God bless you.